Evil is the biggest mystery in human life. Even people who don't believe in God blame God when they hit evil and suffering. Humans are the wildest and most dangerous animal. It's important to distinguish evil from suffering. Evil is evil, but it should have been otherwise. Author Oz Guinness explores the problem of evil and engages the age-old question, if God is God, why do bad things happen? Part two, on this day of discovery. Oz Guinness was born in China during World War II into what some would call evil and troubled times. He left in 1951 after the Chinese Revolution. A graduate of the University of London and Oxford, he's written or edited more than 20 books, including one on evil, written after the events of 9-11, one of the most dramatic acts of violence in history. It's called Unspeakable facing up to the challenge of evil. Now I wrote the book after 9-11. My wife and I actually had the date in our calendar because I was asked to give uh, an evening's talk on evil to Wall Street bankers. It's important to distinguish evil from suffering. And evil, traditionally defined, or has to be changed today a wee bit, is the intent to do harm. In other words, evil is active, whereas suffering is passive. People are the innocent victims of evil done to them or of pain or health problems or whatever. So suffering is passive and evil is active, but they hit people in the same way and they throw up some of the same questions. Oz Guinness presents several steps to help us think through questions about evil and why, if there is a God, he seems to allow bad things to happen. Step one, very simply, is recognize the sources. And they're through our bodies, through nature, and the worst of all, through our fellow human beings. Humans are the wildest and most dangerous animal. The second step for humans thinking through the challenge of evil is simply listen to the questions. When either pain or suffering or evil hit people, there are three questions that bubble up almost instinctively and irrepressibly. The first is, why me? The second, where's God? And the third, how can I stand it? The third step for people is to appreciate the modern transformations of evil. We aren't more evil, but we're much more destructive in the modern world. The fourth and absolutely critical stage is for people to look at the different interpretations, because we want meaning. We want answers to the questions that have bubbled up. And it, you might say there's a thousand and one answers in the room, far too many for the average person to look at. And there may be a thousand and one answers, but in fact, for all intents and purposes, there's a big three. And the big three are three big families of faiths. And I'm using the word family the way philosophers use it. Faiths that have a family resemblance because they all go back to the same sense of the ultimate source of reality. And when you see it that way, the big three families are these. The Eastern, which includes Hinduism, Buddhism, and the New Age movements. And they all go back to an impersonal ground of being. So if you say God, Hindus have thousands of gods. It's God with a small g, an impersonal ground of being. The second family of faiths is the secularist. Atheists, agnostics, materialists, naturalists in science. Think of, say, the new atheists now, like Richard Dawkins. And everything for them goes back to ultimate chance. Chance plus time plus matter, that's us. Then the third family of faiths at its largest is the Abrahamic, which would be Judaism, the Christian faith, and Islam. But in the West, we can mostly say Judaism, the Christian faith, the two biblical faiths which have put their stamp in the West. And of course, they go back to a personal, infinite God, and everything flows out of that. 
And when you look at the big three families of faiths, you see that when it comes to evil, they're not the same. There are huge differences, and the differences make a huge difference. And one needs to look at each of them in turn. The first family of faiths is the Eastern, and I would give them high marks for realism. Buddhism, a kind of religion-sized answer to the problem of evil. As Gautama Buddha says, affliction or uh, dukkha is at the heart of our world. We're caught in a world of illusion. We have desire that takes to craving, that leads to attachment, and we're bound to this wheel of suffering. And in the East, the problem is not that you die. No, no, no. The problem is you're reborn. And you might go around Hindus, say, 35,000 times, and you can go down as well as up, and so on. So the only way out of evil and suffering in the East is detachment, renunciation. And what Buddha calls nirvana is the great deathless lake of extinction. The second family of faith, secularism, is quite different from the Eastern. They fight it, fight it for all it's worth. But in the secularist view, coming from chance, the ultimate meaning of the universe simply isn't there. The universe is meaningless. It's absurd, which is the Latin for very deaf. So if we want to create meaning, we create our own. And we're like Atlas, the Greek giant, who carries the world of his own meaning on his shoulders. So most of the great humanists fight evil. They don't renounce the world or detach themselves like the Buddhists and the Hindus. Take Camus, who was one of my heroes as I journeyed towards faith. In Camus' plague, you have the metaphor of a plague, which is the picture of evil. And the hero, the protagonist, Dr. Rieu, fights it for all his worth. He's passionate. He's outraged seeing anyone die of the plague. And I admire that. But at the end, Camus has Rieu discuss his philosophy. And he says, one day when he's just buried his best friend, I'm facing never-ending defeat. And Camus' famous picture is the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus condemned to roll the boulder up the hill, rolls down again, up again, down again, up again, down again, never-ending defeat. I, when I was a student, knew Bertrand Russell fighting the nuclear issue with his craggy aquiline face, incredible courage and heroism. But Russell admitted he used to read two novels a week to drug his mind and take it off the extinction of the universe and the end of the human species. And so I gave great marks to the humanists and the secularists for the heroism of their fight. But at the end of the day, what Bertrand Russell says, his philosophy was built on the, I'm quoting, the firm foundations of unyielding despair. Or Sartre, the French atheist said, atheism is a cruel long-term business. I've thought it through till the end. There's Camus' never-ending defeat. Heroism in fighting it, but no final answers. The third answer, the third family of faiths, is the biblical. And many people, for example, atheists, they throw at Christians the so-called trilemma. Is evil evil? Is God all good? And is God all-powerful? You can't have all three together, they say. And you can see that objection before Jesus. And you can see that in David Hume in the 18th century. You can see it in the New Atheist today. Interestingly, the easy way out is to relax one of those. Evil is not that evil, but of course it is. That's no answer. God is not all good, but if he's even got a shadow in his character, you could never trust him. Or the third one, maybe God is not all-powerful. That's what Rabbi Kushner does. He doesn't have an all-powerful God. But that is not the biblical answer. The Bible stresses all three. Evil is evil. God is all good. And God is all-powerful. But it gives each of them a little twist, which turns it into a reassurance. Evil is evil, but it should have been otherwise. In other words, it's alien, abnormal, it's a gate crash, it's a party pooper. And so when we hate it, we outrage, that's the way God feels too. I love the fact, if you read John 11, 
which is famous to many people because it has the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, it actually says three times, and it's the story of Jesus face to face prematurely with the death of his good friend Lazarus. And there he is at the tomb. Three times it says he was furious. Two of the words are the strongest Greek word for outrage, fierce indignation. Jesus made the world good, very good as it says in Genesis. He comes into this world, it's broken, marred, ruined, injustice, oppression, tears. And here with his friend cut off in the middle of life, he doesn't thank God for it. He is livid. And of course he addresses and does something. And I love that. We can be shocked by evil. We can be grieving over suffering. And thank God, we look at John 11, you can see Jesus, God's face wet with tears. You can see God's face flushed with anger. And that's the way we should respond to evil too. It should have been otherwise. The second little reassurance in the scripture, is God all good? Yes, no other God has wounds. The God of the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, he cares, he comes, he acts. Take say, the Lord speaking to Moses, I've heard the cries of the children of Israel and their misery and so on. I've come down and I want to send you. Or supremely in the Old Testament, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. He comes to do the will of God, to help the people of God, and he's tortured. So hideously disfigured, he's unrecognizable on our behalf. And of course for us who follow Jesus, that's Jesus on the cross. You may know how Dostoevsky came to faith. He came out of his atheist background and so on, but there was a time in Switzerland, he looked at the painting of the descent of Jesus in the cross, that broken, emaciated body, dead. He looked at it for four hours, and at the end of it he said, I don't know the answer to the problem of evil, but I do know love. And that's our God. When we look at Jesus in the cross, however deep we go in suffering, our Lord has gone deeper to show us that he loves us and cares. The third part of the trilemma is, is God all powerful? And is it rational to trust in God if we don't know why he's doing what he's doing? And maybe he's not all powerful. Interestingly, the greatest answer to this was given by an Oxford tutor who was one of my tutors when I was at Oxford. It's called the parable of the resistance fighter. Imagine we're in World War II. And I hear you want to join the resistance. And I meet you in a bar and say, look, I want you want to join the resistance. I'm the local resistance leader. We'll talk for two hours tonight. If you trust me and you join, this is the last time we'll speak face to face. Too dangerous. But you have to trust me in the dark. Sometimes what I'm doing, absolutely obvious. Sometimes not obvious. I'll be arrest, uh, arresting a friend of ours dressed in Gestapo uniform. You don't realize that out of sight, I'm releasing him. But when the war's over and we've won, the codes will be broken, the stories will be explained, everything will be clear. That's faith in a fallen world. We're in enemy territory. Now the key thing is, can we trust God? And for followers of Jesus, there's two big questions. Is he there, God's existence? And is he good, his character? And both those questions are answered in Jesus, through Jesus, I believe absolutely he's there, and I believe absolutely he's good. Now, what he's doing all the time now, I don't know. But I know why I trust him. Who knows? I'm in the dark about this or that incident, but I'm never in the dark about God because of Jesus. And of course, one day we'll know why, and the secrets will be explained, and God's goodness and justice and what he's doing will be seen. So. The resistance leader knows what he's doing. Author Oz Guinness calls for action in thinking through responses to evil. The fifth step for people thinking it through, and again, it's an invitation as human beings to think it through, 
is they've got to take the appropriate, courageous responses in action. Because understanding evil is not just an, I understand it for myself so I can sit there, but there's evil in the world and we've got to do something. Here I would build in what are the clear Christian responses, because they're the clearest of all of them in history. And the first is surprising one, humility and realism. The worst evils in all history are done by people who are utopian, who think they're good and they're re-engineering the world into their own image. Like Mao Zedong, who thought he had a blank slate and he'd remake China, then 75 million were killed in the process. Utopians are the most dangerous. The second most dangerous people are dualists, people who think they are evil and I'm good. The simple fact is, and Christians come in here strongly, no one's all good and no one's all evil. And as Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil doesn't run down between classes or between nations. It runs down every human heart. It's a famous story of G.K. Chesterton, who was, along with a lot of British intellectuals, asked by the London Times, what's wrong with the world? And they were all asked to send in their answers. And some of them sent in long, elaborate essays and so on. Chesterton, a wonderful Christian journalist, just sent in a postcard. What's wrong with the world? I am G.K. Chesterton. That is a deeply Christian response. If I tackle evil, I've got to recognize I have the same thing in me and I need to be forgiven and repentant and move out humbly when I'm attacking the worst evil. The second thing is truly to have forgiveness. That sounds pious, but you can see that often evil is done to us, so we are suffering. And the Corsican blood feud comes in here, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so on. And what forgiveness does is cut off the past and liberate the future. You can see this, say, Nelson Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. And the tragedy is that many people in the world say humanists. They think forgiveness is a matter of heroism. I am really big when I'm big enough to forgive someone what he's done to me. That's not the Christian way, no. I have done far worse to God, and He's forgiven me. So I can forgive anyone else what they do to me, which is far less than I've done to God. But He's forgiven me, so I pass on that forgiveness to someone else. And that's why Jesus taught His followers to love without limits. And whenever Christians don't forgive, they're not living up to the challenge of following the way of Jesus. The third thing, of course, is the courage to do something. And you can see that in the West, this has been shaped by a Jewish and a Christian response coming from the prophets, coming from Jesus or William Wilberforce against the abolition of slavery, for the abolition of slavery, or Martin Luther King, many other reforms. Almost all the great reforms in 2,000 years were inspired by faith and led by people of faith who followed Jesus. Now you can see that the Western tradition of reform, the West is not perfect, we have terrible evils in the West, but the Western tradition of reforming those evils is unique in history, and no other civilization has it. And that's because answering evil isn't just a matter of meaning and interpretation and a personal answer. We have got to do something. One last step to think through for people looking at the challenge of evil is to appreciate the silver linings. Nothing is so terribly evil that there's not some silver lining. But you have to say very carefully, the silver lining is not the explanation. It's not the understanding why. We often don't know why someone's suffering cancer, someone's kid is knocked down by a car, or whatever it is. We don't know why. But even in the worst of things, there is often a silver lining, even in Auschwitz, dare one say. One silver lining is that evil, not suffering so much, but evil assumes absolute judgment. In other words, people say everything's relative. But when you're up against real evil, palpable, malignant evil, you know there has to be an absolute moral judgment.
You know, W.H. Auden came to faith as a Christian, as an atheist, when he saw evil in World War II. He had fought in the Spanish Civil War. He came over to New York to escape from Europe. And he followed the documentaries every Saturday. One Saturday in New York, he saw the documentary of the Siege of Poland. And Nazi stormtroopers were bayoneting women and children, callously, brutally. And the German audience, this is Yorkville, Upper East Side in Manhattan, the German audience shouted out, kill them, kill them, egging on their fellow Germans. Auden sat there and he was horrified. He said in two minutes, his whole worldview was turned around. First, he said, I knew we, including himself, we were evil. But secondly, he said, I knew we needed a moral absolute. He said, I spent all my life saying, there are no absolutes, everything's relative. And he said, to be able to say that Hitler was absolutely wrong, and absolutely evil, there had to be an absolute. He said, I left the cinema a seeker after an unconditional absolute and met Christ. In other words, the evil assumes and requires an absolute judgment. And that's good, because evil does, and life does. Another silver lining that people often discover in evil is that the worst evil highlights the best, the contrast of, say, character and love. And that's often the way, in the darkest night, human goodness, and of course that's even more of a mystery than human evil, human goodness and above all, the goodness of God shines through. So there's a silver lining even in some of the worst of experience. As I said, it's not the rationale, it's not the explanation. It doesn't give us an answer to the question why, but it gives us a silver lining, which is an extraordinarily important. You know, the worst question of all, when you summarize the challenge of evil is, after Auschwitz, which is the symbol for that malignant evil of the 20th century, after Auschwitz, can there be a God? Theodor Adorno, the German scholar, said, after Auschwitz, there is no God. After Auschwitz, there is no love. After Auschwitz, there is no poetry. What's the answer to that? Well, I'm often asked that. Interestingly, the best answer, the deepest answer, comes from someone who was in Auschwitz, Viktor Frankl. And it's in his last book, Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning, which was published after his death, and he says two things. He says, first, the people who say that, after Auschwitz there can't be a God, were not in Auschwitz. Frankl was there. He says, in Auschwitz, more people discovered faith and deepened faith than lost it. And as I said earlier, it was the atheist intellectuals who had no why who took their lives. As I said, I don't pretend to know all the whys. But I would say, if I know God, as I said earlier, through Jesus, I can say, I do not understand you, but I trust you. I know why you're there, because of Jesus. I know why you're good, because of Jesus. I don't have doubts about that. We're in the postmodern world, and postmoderns love to say, you can't have narratives. You know, it's no called meta-narratives, that fancy word for the big stories. But the Christian faith has an unashamed big story. God created. Human beings fell. God entered the world to put it right, what we call redemption. And one day there will be restoration. And I just love the passages in scripture that speak of the day when the last tear is gone, when justice will be restored and so on, when the lion will, down the lion will lie down with the lamb, and so on. And you can see how these great texts from Isaiah 2 in the Old Testament or the New Testament, say they're on the walls of the United Nations building. Human beings long, they long for a day, and that cry, how can I stand it? How long, O Lord, is a mute cry of the oppressed and the longing for the day that will come. And Christians will say, we know when it will be when Christ comes again. So personally, I long for that day when the last tear has fallen.